Hello and welcome back to Probability Theory, the video course where we talk about stochastic things and statistics. And in today's part 28, we will talk about the weak law of large numbers. Moreover, in a future video, we will also talk about the so-called strong law of large numbers. However, now before we start explaining what these laws of large numbers are, I first want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And please don't forget, as a supporter you have access to a lot of additional material, which you can find with the link in the description. And with that said, we can immediately start explaining what we have for the law of large numbers. Indeed, it's a connection we have between the theoretical probability we have for an event A and the so-called empirical probability. More precisely, the theoretical probability we have from our model, so we simply measure it with our probability measure P. On the other hand, the empirical probability is something we have already discussed in the introduction of this course. In some sense, this is how the probability looks in the real world, and we also call it the relative frequency of an event. So this means we just take a number of samples and let's call this one the total number. And then we just look how many of these outcomes lie in the event A. And then we expect if the total number is large enough that this ratio we can form is close to the actual theoretical probability. And exactly this connection in the mathematical sense is called the law of large numbers. And the explicit formulation in the weak sense we will discuss in this video here. And in order to understand what we actually will do here, I would say we first look at an example. And of course it should not be a complicated example, so let's take the toss of a coin again. So as always we take a fair coin with heads and tails and then you know this is easy to model because we just need a sample space with two outcomes. So let's call this one omega zero where we have heads and tails as possible outcomes. And moreover the corresponding probability measure should be called p zero as well. And then since we have a fair coin both probabilities here should be one half. Okay, and now if we want to talk about the relative frequency of a given event, we have to repeat this random experiment as often as we want. Therefore, the model of that would be a new sample space given as a product space. Repeating it infinitely many times means that we have a Cartesian product with infinitely many factors. And you also know the corresponding probability measure is given as a product measure. So I think from former videos you already know how this works in detail, so we don't have to explain a lot. Important here is just that you can see that we can easily define random variables x, k. They are defined on omega and they should be real valued. And now x, k should just tell us if we got heads in the kth toss. This means there are only two possibilities, either we get out 1 for yes, or zero for no. And formally we would write we have one if the kth component of omega is equal to heads. So in other words, repeating this random experiment is now given with random variables. Because they tell us what happens in each toss here. However, you know for the relative frequencies here, we will not do infinitely many tosses, but we will stop at a finite number before. So let's simply say we look at exactly n tosses. And then if we want to know how many heads we got, we have to form the sum from k starting with 1 and ending at n. And then when we divide that by n, we get the empirical probability of getting heads. So you should see this is exactly the relative frequency of getting heads, but formulated with random variables. This has the advantage that we can introduce a new random variable here as well. This will be x over line with index n. So we could say this is the average of the first n random variables here. Hence, as before, this is also a random variable from omega into r. 
However, now the possible outcomes would lie between 0 and 1. Okay, there we have it. This random variable represents the relative frequency of getting heads in the first n tosses. Therefore, we actually expect that this random variable should converge to one half. So if we send n to infinity, this relative frequency should represent the actual probability. Or to say it more precisely, exactly this convergence we want to show now. However, we immediately get one important question here. What does this convergence actually mean? So what is the explicit convergence that goes in here? And now I can tell you, the weak law of large numbers gives us one possibility for this convergence. In this case, one says that the random variable converges in probability to one half. So this is a special notion of a convergence and I will explain that now. But first we should state the assumptions we need in the general formulation of the weak law of large numbers. As in the example, we need random variables for each natural number k. And moreover, the whole family of these random variables should be independent. Please recall what this actually means. It means that for any finite selection of random variables here, we have the independence. More concretely, it tells us that the probability of this event here can be written as a product. And this equation holds for any finite index set j and for all values xj. Okay, so this is what we definitely need. We need the independence to formulate this law. And please note, by construction, we have the independence in the example above. However, we need some additional requirement as well, because we want that all the random variables look similar, they should have the same distribution. So there we say, they are identically distributed. And also there, we can give a quick definition of this term. So please recall, for any random variable, we can define a new probability measure defined on the Borel sigma algebra of R. And this one is called the distribution of the random variable and denoted with P index xk. And now with respect to this probability measure, we can measure a subset B of the real numbers if it is a Borel set. And now the claim here is that it does not matter which random variable we choose because they all have the same distribution. Therefore, we can say we can always choose the first one. And then for all k, we have this equality. So you could say, essentially, all these random variables act the same. And again, we definitely have that by construction for the random variables above. Okay, so you see, we have two important requirements here for the random variables. And this assumption is so important and it occurs a lot that we have a short notation for that. We simply call it IID. Hence, you can remember, for the weak law of large numbers, we need the IID assumption for the random variables. But, moreover, we also need an additional one. We need that all the expectations exist. And a short formulation for that would be to say that the expectation of the absolute value of x1 is finite. Here please note, it does not matter which random variable we choose, because all the expectations have to be the same anyway. In other words, the additional requirement here is that all the random variables are integrable. And now under these assumptions, we have a convergence in the sense from before. This means we consider the relative frequency given by the random variables again. And then we simply check how far this one is off from the expectation mu. This means we define mu to be the expectation of x1. Therefore, mu is also the expectation of every other random variable and also the expectation of this sum. And now we can ask how likely it is that we are off by a given value epsilon. In other words here, epsilon can be given as any positive number. Therefore, now we have to measure this event with respect to the probability measure p. This means what we get here is a real number for every natural number n. 
So in conclusion, this is simply a sequence in the real numbers. And you know, such a sequence can be a convergent one. And this is exactly the claim here. It's a convergent sequence and it converges to zero. And please note, this holds no matter which epsilon we choose here. And moreover, we have a special name for this convergence. We say that the random variable x over line n converges in probability. More precisely, it converges in probability to mu. So whenever you see the term converges in probability, it actually means this epsilon statement from above. Okay, and with that, we now know the weak law of large numbers. And in fact, we can immediately prove it for an important case. Namely, for the case that all the random variables involved have a well-defined variance. And as always, we can introduce the symbol sigma to write sigma squared is equal to the variance. Okay, and now we just have to calculate with the expectation and the variance. First, the expectation of x over line is given by mu as well. There you see, we can prove this by using the properties of the expectation. So we can pull out the factor 1 over n. And also, since it's linear, we can pull out the whole sum. And then inside, we just have the expectation of xk. However, this is the same for every random variable, so we have n times mu divided by n. So as I said before, we get out the expected value mu again. Okay, then the next question is, what can we say about the variance of this new random variable? Indeed, there we can just use the properties of the variance. So also here, we can use the calculation rules we have already learned. Most importantly, if we pull out a factor, we get it squared. So we have 1 over n squared here, and we can also pull out the sum because we have the independence of the random variables. Therefore, as before, we have the same number in the sum now, namely sigma squared. Hence, the result is that we have sigma squared divided by n. This is a very important result because it tells us that the variance here changes with n. And indeed, this allows us to use Chebyshev's inequality. So please recall, it tells us that this probability here is bounded by the variance divided by epsilon squared. And now you already know, instead of x, we have x over line with index n here. Therefore, you should see the left hand side here is exactly the statement we have in the weak law of large numbers. And moreover, the right hand side now has sigma squared divided by n involved. And since sigma squared and epsilon squared are fixed numbers here, we can send n to infinity. And that's the whole idea here. We see that the right hand side gets smaller and smaller if n increases. So this means the left hand side here has to be convergent to zero as well. So we see the weak law of large numbers is already proven by using Chebyshev's inequality. Of course, this only works in the case where we have a finite variance, but you know we often have that in applications. Actually, I would say it's a good idea to look at applications of this weak law of large numbers with the next video. So I really hope I meet you there and have a nice day. Bye bye.